<laughs> so we're delighted to be with you. Thank you for coming. It, look, it looks like we have pages and pages of people here, and that's thrilling. We can finally say we've toured the world, but we, we, we've just done it through Zoom. This is a song I learned on a beach in Florida from a folk singer when I was 21 years old. And it's a song about coming home, and I think, I think we've all felt a kind of interesting version of, in some ways, homesickness this year. And as things uh, seem to be getting a little bit better, it, it almost feels like homecoming. Oh, the springtime returns to the login. sweetly sings o'er the green fertile plain and I'll take the road that is dearest to me the road to drum love that winds to the sea for I Irish group. How do you like that? 
and you're going to sing hey daughter ho daughter the room a do a day and folks make sure you're all muted because if you're not muted and you're making a sound that actually might interfere with um our sound as well um elwood is playing these are real bones there's they're bones from somebody who did not sing on the chorus so just note to self As I went out the marketplace, what do you think I see? What a fine young piper laddie, you think the northern green, singing, hey daughter, ho daughter, do not do a day. Singing, hey daughter, ho daughter, do not do a day. He played a reel and he played a jig, he played the sweet song. Sounded great. <laughs> Bravo. Yay! Oh, good. So the, the sound quality is a little bit better. All right. Good to know. Um, actually, why don't you grab your dulcimer? We have to start playing our astonishing array of unusual instruments. And I, I have, as some of you are familiar with, I have a few jokes for you. And we, we are doing this concert because we have been invited by the Framingham Public Library in Framingham, Massachusetts. And so I thought I should tell my favorite library joke. I, I wonder if you know this one, Lara, as a librarian. But so this guy goes to a library and he's talking to the clerk and he says, I'll have a burger and fries. And the clerk is like, you're in a library, you know that, right? And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I'll have a burger and fries. Do you know that one? You know, I don't. I, I've heard the uh, the one my sister used to tell me, which was the, she's an audiologist and I'm a librarian. She used to say, what did the librarian ask the doctor? And I would say, what? She'd say, would you like fries with that? So, <laughs> <laughs> hating on my profession, but I haven't heard the quiet version. I like that one better. <laughs> um, let's do the Jamestown Homeward Bound with double dulcimers. So let me uh, just back up. Let's, let's back this thing up a little bit so people can see our dulcimers. Yeah, just go back and watch that rug, yeah. Jamestown Homeward Bound is, what do you need? Uh, a song that was written circa 1847 and just such a beauty. I've been doing a lot of teaching on Zoom for the last year um, because I've been home a lot. And uh, this is one that I teach, and it's really fun to teach these songs because we unpack them in the sense that 
I learn all about them musically. This has about an octave and a half range, which is a, a lot of range for a song. And I think that's one of the things that makes it so beautiful. The Jamestown Homeward Bound. Um, and we, Elwood and I live in Warren, Rhode Island. We are a block away from a working waterfront. Um, this town was settled by European Anglo-Celtic people in the 1600s and it was a, a very important Native American area as well. And um, there's, this is an old whaling town, and people still are involved with the fishing and shellfishing industry. We can get lobsters anytime we want. So this is a seafaring song, and so many of the seafaring songs are about leaving home, coming home, or homesickness. And this one is about coming home. <laughs> heart with joy is filled when the crops are good and sound. But who can feel the wild delight of the sailor's homeward bound? The few long years have passed away since we left all the freedom shore. Our long felt wish has come at last, and we're homeward bound. As the maiden's eye belongs for our return to the land where milk and the honey flows and liberty was born. So fill our sails with the favoring gales in which it makes all around. We'll give three cheers for our starry flag. And the Jamestown homeward bound, and the Jamestown homeward bound. amazing. I turned off the Wi-Fi on my cell phone and I closed one application on my computer. If anyone had told me a year ago I was going to know all this stuff, <laughs> I learned so much tech. Do you, I, I am on the computer a lot and I dream about it at night. I'm just, I'm on the computer even in my dreams. 
but what a wonderful way to connect with people. I mean, that, there's been some beautiful silver linings. I mean, besides the fear of death and doom and sickness all year long, which was not, has not been my favorite, um, there have been a lot of interesting silver, silver linings, and, and for that I'm very grateful. And one of them is, is having an exciting night like tonight. I, how many people are in attendance now, Lara? I see 114 computers. Often there are two or three people on many of the computers. So that's 5,087. <laughs> good math. <laughs> She's been really good at math. <laughs> As long as I've known her. So here's a song that Kathleen um, requested, and this is a poignant beauty, a centuries-old song, and part of the most famous English-language ballad collection called the Child Ballad Collection, and that is the last name of, of a professor who put together um, detailed research of over 300 songs. This one is known as Mary Hamilton, and we know it as Four Marys, and this is a Ritchie family version from Jean Ritchie, in Eastern Kentucky. Tonight they'll 
Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I love that one for you. Um, somebody wants to know what tuning you're using for Four Marys. That was, um, I'm four equally distant strings on the mountain dulcimer and I'm starting bass for CGCC. So it's a DAD like tuning that's tuned down a full step and that's my most common tuning of about, so of about <laughs> 20 tunings that I play in. Um, and so that, whoever asked that is clearly a mountain dulcimer play, player because that's the thing in the mountain dulcimer world. People are always saying, what tuning was that in? Because it's a diatonic fretboard. It's, it's a diff, different than the guitar, so we tune and retune a lot. And I think that's a beautiful aspect of the mountain dulcimer and all the technique behind it. If you're interested in ballads and that we just sang you a ballad there, again, I'm going to use that expression unpack. There's a lot to unpack in these ballads, a lot of history, a lot of society, a lot of boundary crossing, a lot about gender, race, class, all that kind of stuff. Fascinating stories. These are the old Celtic Anglo story songs that made their way to the new world in America. And I'm doing a whole class on that in June through Dulcimer U out of Western Carolina University. So feel free to check out all the stuff. We're doing a lot of stuff on Zoom right now and it's exciting. We're doing workshops coming up, um, dulcimer repertoire for uh, the Walnut Valley Association in Kansas. So feel free to go to our website. And Lara, if you don't mind typing our, our website into the chat, it's at waterdonnelly.com. You can just Google Aubrey and Elwood and because okay. nobody yeah, has our names and, and, and our website will come up and Is look at our hyphen? calendar. What's that? It's a hyphen. At water hyphen donnelly.com yep and also if you have questions feel free to email me some of you have my email but my email is aubrey folk i'm, I'm going to type that one into the chat um yeah thank you lara actually lara if you don't mind um oh yeah at water you got it right lara at water hyphen donnelly.com and then i'm gonna put my email to everybody Feel free to email me if you have questions about classes we're teaching. We're teaching quite a few subjects. We do dulcimer. We do we're just about repertoire. Songs, so. What's that? Or just about songs or anything. Yeah, we we like we like hearing from you, and we we get lots of really cool emails almost every day. Uh, people asking questions or saying nice things to us. Let's do Spanish Lady. We have to do that because this is we're 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 celebrating Irishness a little bit tonight because we're really close to St. Patrick's Day. So you can do a Spanish Lady. Yeah, it's an <laughs> Irish song called the Spanish Lady, and uh, I gotta make uh, corned beef and cabbage soon. I'm you know no, note to self. Yeah, so sing along on this one. Some of you know this. This is a very beloved Irish song called the Spanish Lady with these, this funny chorus where you sing numbers backwards by twos.
ask us what those numbers mean and they are that's called a floating verse they're from the verse is from another song called the wheel of fortune and they they are symbolizing the numbers on the wheel of fortune not the actual game show that, that you half of you probably watch now that guy watches wheel of fortune right yeah. i record it oh you record it so uh for you dulcimer players out there tuning to dgdd reverse ionian and some of you are like, okay, we'll do As I Roved Out, which is a beautiful Irish song that has some corrupted history. This, this happens a lot in these old songs. They, they get passed orally for, for generations. So there's sometimes strange, erroneous references. I think there was a king of England during the, the Napoleonic Wars, for example, not a queen. And in this song, the premise is so interesting. This guy stumbles on his, upon his true love and he's married a different woman because by royal decree, because he was not fighting in the Napoleonic Wars, he was obligated to marry the wife of a landed man who was off fighting in the wars. Did that make sense? Think so. In order for the land to be worked, to continue to be run and managed and worked. You had to marry someone could, else's wife. Right, you had to marry somebody else's wife. And apparently women couldn't manage things themselves. So, But that's a whole other story. We'll, we won't go down that road. But anyway, that's what's going on in this song. And it's it's so odd. So, um, yeah, and I have a degree in psych. So I'm thinking, yeah, these, these people are definitely having issues here. It's a beautiful song called As I Roved Out. As I roved out one fine day I 
took off my hat and I did salute her. I did salute her most courageously. And as she turned around, the tears fell from saying, false young man, you delude me. And the diamond I gave to you a diamond ring to wear on your right hand. But the vows you made, they went and you rolled them. And you married the lass, you passed the land. If I marry the lass, you passed the land. Nice. Thank you. A lot of these old beautiful songs, just like any stories, have to do with, with barriers that we all experience in our lives and, and whether or not we can relate to the actual details of the stories. I, th I think we can relate to a lot of these themes of, of separation that, that so many of these folk songs have. And speaking of that, let's do Kill Kelly since that, that subject came up. This is such a beautiful and, and poignant song that was written in the 1970s when these two brothers, Peter and Stephen Jones, found letters in their attic, their family attic in Baltimore. And the letters had been written during the latter part of the 19th century when, as some of you know, in Ireland, a lot was going on and there was this mass exodus of about 8 million people during the second half of the 19th century. The Irish were starving and a lot of that starvation was political and there were political, religious, there were high rents, un unemployment, different kinds of persecution happening and people left Ireland in droves. And we, we've often been comparing this time in history to 100 years ago when there was a pandemic. And imagine what the pandemic was like 100 years ago. We, our communication is so different now. So imagine leaving Ireland in the 19th century and that was it. They had what they called an American wake sometimes for their loved ones because they figured they would never see them again. And so that's what is so poignant about this song it's a true story and it's about family members being separated so um and what these brothers did to to distill and cull from these copious these wordy prolific letters is quite remarkable in this song kill kelly ireland 
Kill Kelly Island, 18 and 60. My dear and loving son John, your good friend, the schoolmaster Pat McNamara's so good has to write his words down. Your brothers have all gone to find work in England. The house is so empty and sad. The crop of potatoes is sorely infected. A third to half of them bad. And your sister Bridget and Patrick O'Donnell are gonna get married in June. And your mother says not to work on the railroad and be sure to come on home soon. Kill Kelly Island, 18 and 70. Hello to your missus and to your four children. May they grow healthy and strong. Michael has got a little wee bit of trouble. I guess that he never will learn. Because of the deafness, there's no turn. version of that song sorry about that <laughs> well i loved it thank you <laughs> sure it's it's very real on zoom um in some ways and and we're, we're just uh our natural selves and and that's a a very delicate song for us to do and i've noticed uh, we just played it the other day perfectly fine but i've noticed that uh Easy you get can get thrown off yeah but anyway, um, that's on one of our albums that we did years ago called The Willow Tree. And you, you can... Like The Willow Tree. Uh, like The Willow Tree. You can access all our recordings, either listen to them on YouTube, or you can order them off of our website, either digitally or hard copy. And um, this one, we'll, we'll do Imagine Peace since we're set up for it. This is a request, Imagine Peace. And I'm playing the Irish whistle, by the way. And I'll just show you, I'll quickly show you. This is my collection. 
And these, like the mountain dulcimer, are diatonic, and so I have lots of different keys. But both of these songs right now that we're doing, I'm using a B, B flat whistle, but I don't think either time I'm actually in that key. Um, anyway, long story, I don't have to explain all that. But this is a, a tune that was written by Phil Edmonds, who is a friend who lives here in Providence, Rhode Island, and it's called Imagine Peace. Beautiful. Love it. Thank you. Thanks, friends. A favorite. Got some people saying in the comments you're playing all their favorites tonight. Oh good. I'm taking it. I'm gonna I'm gonna just take a quick peek at everybody. I like looking at everybody. Wow. My goodness. There's a lot of you out there. Oh, it's so nice to see you. Five pages of you. And I I, I can fit four thousand on each page. <laughs> Just kidding, 25 per page. Oh, hey, what, what's Irish and comes out in the spring? Patio furniture. Furniture. Patio furniture. <laughs> um, do you know why you should never iron a four leaf clover? Because you don't want to press your luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, and okay, everybody unmute and say Irish wristwatch five times fast. Irish wish Irish 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 yeah, I, was, I see, I, I've always collected silly jokes. Here's, here's like this weird package of strange jokes. Look, look the one on the top. 
funniest quarantine jokes. So I've been I've been into pandemic humor <laughs> lately, and but I just I love looking through those. I've had that that packet of notes is like twenty years old, and but I was looking at one that was, um, what do you call a filthy chicken who crosses the road twice? <laughs> it's just so dumb, a dirty double crosser. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just love stuff like that. Um, and one time when we were in Texas, our playing in Texas, our friends said, I could get in my truck and drive all day and I'm still on my land. And Elwood said to him, I used to have a truck like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, have you heard about the one about the seagulls? Why do seagulls fly over the sea? Because they would be called bagels if they flew over the bay. I've heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot that I have heard. Oh, a lot that I have heard, but I'm always pleased to learn a new one. Like, um, like Elwood came home a couple weeks ago with a map of the world. And, and he, he, he gave me a dart. And he said, wherever this lands, we're going when this pandemic is over. Looks like we're going to spend two weeks behind the fridge. <laughs> I like that or, or um uh I finished Netflix. That was that was a pandemic humor thing. I finished Netflix. Maybe it's time you told an Uncle Boo Boo story. No thing, no Uncle Boo Boo. You better get up close to the microphone for this. A little bit, I guess. I don't know if I, how many of you remember Uncle Boo Boo. He ran into trouble all his life pretty much. When he was uh, younger, um, he had a hard time finding work, and he finally got a job with a farmer who wasn't really looking for much help, but he thought he'd give him a try, and he gave him a wheelbarrow and said, take this wheelbarrow and get to work. If uh, you give me any trouble, I'm going to fire you. So wheel Uncle Boo Boo takes the wheelbarrow, and he goes. About five minutes later, he comes back. He says to the farmer, I think there's something wrong with your wheelbarrow. Every time I roll it, it goes click, 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 click. And the farmer said, you're fired. And Uncle Booba said, why are you firing me? I'm just telling you about your broken wheelbarrow. Well, the farmer says, every time you push that wheelbarrow, it's supposed to go click, 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 click. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually, Uncle Booba did make some money. Mm -hmm. In fact... He got pretty, got pretty well off. He must have got his degree from uh, the first church of the Frigidaire or something. But he made his, made his living pretty well. In fact, he was a, a, a salesman, and he had to travel a lot. And every time he came home, his chauffeur would pick him up at the train station. That's how wealthy he got finally. Well, one time after a long trip, he came home, waited at the train station, and his chauffeur wouldn't show up. So he just kept waiting and waiting, and no chauffeur. And finally, he sees one of his neighbors come by in a pickup truck, and he flags him down, and his neighbor's taking him home, and he asks his neighbor, so what's happened since I've been gone around here? The neighbor says, not much. Uncle Boo Boo says, well, something must have happened. I've been gone a long time. And the neighbor said, well, some folks say your dog died. Uncle Boo Boo said, well, that's something. How did my dog die? His neighbor said, well, some folks say he ate some burned horse flesh and died. And Uncle Boo Boo said, well, how did my dog get some burned horse flesh in the first place? And the neighbor said, well, some folks say when your barn burned down, a horse was in there, and it got burned up in the fire, and the dog ate some burned horse flesh, and it died too. Uncle Wooba says, well, how did my barn get on fire? Well, his neighbor says, well, some folks say a spark jumped from the house over to the barn, and the whole barn went out in flames, and the horse was in there and got burned up in the fire. And the dog ate some of the burned horse flesh, and it died too. Uncle Wooba says, how did a spark jump over from the house to my barn? neighbor said, well, some folks say when the candle fell off the coffin, it ignited the curtains and the whole house went up in flame. And then the spark jumped from the house to the barn and the barn got caught in the fire. And 
burned down and the horse got caught in there and the dog ate the burned horse flesh and it died too. Uncle Booba says, oh my goodness, I lost my dog, my barn, my house. Wait a minute. Why was there a coffin in my house? And his neighbor said, well, some folks say that your mother up and died when your wife took off with the chauffeur. But, since nothing else much happened around here. <laughs> <laughs> Did you follow that? Did you get that? That was awesome. <laughs> All right, let's do, um, let's do Single Sailor. This is, a, this is a song that was collected in an archive of Rhode Island folk songs. This is an old, old Irish song. Some of you might know it as John Riley. Um, Joan Baez, for example, sang John Riley years ago. And folks that sing ballads call this a broken token ballad. That when two young sweethearts are parting ways, they, they break something or they have something broken and they each keep half as a, for, as a form of ID later on. And these two young sweethearts were separated for seven years. And that's a common time frame. And um, they are sort of reunited, except that she doesn't recognize him. So that's, that's all I'm going to say. But um, thankfully, they had something that they broke between them and they each kept half. Um, the Single Sailor, also known as John Riley, centuries old Irish song collected in Rhode Island in the mid 20th century. Just 
return for to marry thee. Okay, this is called Polly Put the Kettle On, and it's a dance tune with some dance moves, so feel free to get up and dance. <laughs> joke that has uh, Caribbean, tropical, again, that fusion of Celtic, African origins called Johnny Be Fair. And it's about a girl who's having trouble finding a husband. <laughs> Lovely. 
I love it. You want to sit back closer again? Let's do um, song will remain. Yes, very funny, right? They might have had a hard time following that last Uncle Boo Boo story since we're not alive. But later on in life, you got to know about this. Uncle Boo Boo uh, ended up being a, a minister. He went on computer and became a minister online and, and uh, moved into this house. And across the street was his friend who also was a minister. And one day the two of them are outside and they're banging a sign in the, into the dirt. And the sign said, turn back now or forever be lost. And this car came by and somebody in the car rolled down the window and yelled out the window, religious fanatics. And then the car kept going and all of a sudden we heard a screech and a big old splash. And Uncle Boo Boo looked at his friend. He said, I don't know, maybe we should have wrote something different on the sign like bridge out ahead. <laughs> Good one. Instead of turn back or forever be lost. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> anyway, so much for Uncle Boo Boo. <laughs> Uncle Boo Boo. Okay, so the Uncle Boo Boo start, story started about 20 years ago at the John C. Campbell Folk School. And that's one of our most beloved places that we have appeared at and taught at over the years. And I'm right now I'm doing a Zoom program through them um, on clogging, which I'll do for you next as we start to wrap up our program tonight. But there was a, a work study guy there. He was a French Canadian guy named Robin, Robin, and he told the Uncle Boo Boo stories. <laughs> and he just, he told the one about the wheelbarrow and the, and the barn, the, the barn burning down. And, and then uh, ever since then, people, people would send you uh, more ideas. Uncle Boo Boo's ideas, yeah. So here's a here's a lovely song written by uh, Peter Knight. What was he uh, from Sea Life Span or Fairport Convention? W one of the folk rock groups in the UK that uh, brought to life so many of the old folk songs. So this this is an original from him called "The Song Will Remain."
Lovely. Oh my. Hey. Hey. All right, my friends, we have one more number for you. I'm, I saved the dancing for last. I've been um, teaching a, um, a dance class for the John C. Campbell Folk School right, right there. And I, as a lot of you know, I'm a freestyle flat foot clogger. And I want to thank the Framingham Public Library for inviting us to do this free to the public event. It's really wonderful to offer these occasionally and see so many of you in attendance. And we just, we thank you for being with us tonight. And we, we send love out to all of you. So let, let me just, let me just show you a few steps here. I tried to put on colorful socks so you could see my feet better. I don't know if it works. <laughs> you can't really tell. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta do like what Michael Jackson used to do. So try this at home. Actually try this one. That's good for the knees. do the clogging or was it for women or men? I love that question because I definitely delve in that kind of subject. Um, both men and women did flat footing and that type of freestyle step dancing that I do in the United States and Ireland and England, but there were, there were certain kinds of steps that were attributed more to certain genders, like women would do much more demure and low to the ground type steps until about the generation before me. And then the men did the more flashy flamboyant steps like the wheel. Mm. And you see that in other cultures too. Like one year I, I studied um, Navajo dance and the men would historically do the wild athletic hoop dance and the women would do the jingle dance where they just did a lot of demure stepping. So um, that type of thing in traditional dance is across the board in a lot of cultures, but in, for example, Navajo dance, women are starting to do the hoop dancing too. And in <laughs> freestyle clogging, women are doing all the steps now. So yeah, I, I find that kind of history really interesting. I was saying Thank that you. her son would like you to show the bones a little bit and how they oh. work. That'd be cool. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, me... It's just uh, shin bones from cattle and the, the bellies go together. So you'd have to find out where the bellies are. So the bellies match up. And then I put one of the bones between my first and second finger and my second and ring finger. And I hold them this way. Now the one closest to me that's going to hold it down with my middle finger. It's going to hold it down to the palm of my hand. Hold it down. It's not going to move at all. The second one, that's the one that moves. I'm kind of guiding it with my ring finger so it doesn't go flying off. And then I flip it toward you. Get my first note. And 
on the way back I get the other two. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of put some kind of rhythm in it. But basically, it's just this. Okay. So, cool. thank yeah. you. That was yeah, very cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some people play with both hands, you know. Both <laughs> uh, There's a whole group of, uh, they have a festival. There's a festival where they play bones. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, the whistle's pretty cool. Um, it, it's the force of your breath. You can you can make more than one note without even moving your fingers, depending on how hard you're blowing into it. So you can do this, or this, or. <laughs> That's my favorite. I just blew out his miracle ear. <laughs> So every now and then it's it's called overblowing it or something like that. I actually make notes that you're like not really supposed to, but it like that's that's an overblown note right there. You can make four notes there. Hold your ears for yeah. a minute. So I think the whistle is actually a really hard instrument because there's so much control in um, your breath and, and it, the force and the direction of how you blow that air into the whistle. We do this fun routine when we do school assemblies with kids. We do this funny routine and Elle would like, I, I play all the different whistles and I demonstrate them and I ask the kids questions about um, the size of an instrument and the pitch and stuff like that. And Elwood like does this crazy dancing behind me and the kids. Sometimes the floss. <laughs> yeah, sometimes he does the floss. No, so that's so April. <laughs> but anyway, this is my lowest one that I have right here. Um, you see. Yeah. And then I'm just gonna play a few samples here. This is a plastic whistle, um, and this is an that was a D and this is an E. And this one has, I don't know how well you can see, but it actually has, I forget what you call these things, but um, those things assist you in covering the holes because sometimes my hand is just not big enough dependent, depending on how the whistle is constructed. This is a very traditional type of tin whistle, very Irish. And each one requires a sort of tactile familiarity to, to be used to how it feels and where where those holes are and how much breath, because each one is different as far as how much breath it, it, and the smaller it is, the less breath. And, it, and so you don't want to blow too hard or else you'll make some really horrible sounds. Um, getting real small here. This one is so um, tiny that it's like a dog whistle. You won't hear it. <laughs> Wait, I gotta show you something. I really have a dog whistle. <laughs> oh man, could you come down with a couple of bones? <laughs> but that was my my father. Uh, my father had a whole collection of dog whistles. I I don't know. He had, he had all kinds of stuff. But anyway. Um, this is my highest one, and this is a G. <laughs> we'll do a 40 second limberjack routine for you. Yeah. Show you what one little one little 
team with that? Just, um, I just had them dancing side by side, and then I let the guy jump on the horse. Right, right. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't.